I'm super excited today to have as my guest, Dr. Irene Kopp. So Dr. Irene Kopp and the Success Shift Institute, which she created, are on a mission to grow resilient individuals and organizations by helping them connect the dots between hidden factors such as unrecognized trauma and chronic disease. Her expertise spans from Eastern to Western medicine. She's a medical doctor and a doctor of chiropractic, and she helps purpose-driven high achievers shift from stress to success in all areas of life. So Dr. Irene, thank you so, so much for being here today. Uh, I am so thrilled. Thank you, Dr. Rena Marie. I'm excited to share you with my audience. I know I've been interviewed by you a couple of times and it's been just such a joy. And I wanted to share your message um, of trauma. We're seeing and hearing a lot of people talking about trauma these days. But I really would love for you to start, since our audience is mostly professionals, with what really is trauma? And then we'll go into like the unrecognized traumas that people are dealing with that we're not going to get at if we just ask the question, do you have any traumas in your life? So share with us. I'd love to. I'd love to. And I, I especially, it makes my heart sing that that your audience is healthcare professionals, right? Because that's how you and I and, and everyone are going to help so many more people in the world is through that ripple effect. Beautiful. Absolutely. beautiful. Thank you. Absolutely. So I, based on my personal experience, my professional experience, my education, mostly personal experience, I will say, I have a broader definition of trauma than is perhaps typically considered. And most people, when they think of trauma, they think of the big T trauma, right? Mm -hmm. um, abuse, neglect, uh, assault, uh, going off to war, right? Those are the traumas that they, they consider. And yet there is so much more to trauma and what I call your trauma load that you may be carrying. Think of it like, you know, you've got a backpack on your back or, you know, just, and it's getting heavier and heavier every time you put one more trauma in there because it's not being cleared out. It's not being healed. Mm. And so trauma in its simplest is any time you, and this could be physically, mentally, emotionally, and I'm going to throw in there energetically or spiritually. Mm -hmm feel overwhelmed, powerless, out of control, vulnerable, afraid, victimized by life. And so, and as I said, it can be on a physical level too. So a trauma, like pun intended, like a physical trauma, like an injury, yeah. also causes a trauma to your nervous system. An illness causes a trauma to your whole system, not just to the part of you that's ill. And then you layer on that the, the, the trauma, the emotional trauma of perhaps a diagnosis mm. to go with it, right? So it's like a, a, this nasty perpetuating cycle that just, you know, if you say spirals you down and down and down. And so when you start to look at things like this, and how about... When I talk about unrecognized trauma in the green room, I shared with you that I came to this aha myself because I did not realize the true load of trauma I was carrying until I was at least 50 years old. I did not realize that I had an abusive childhood because my father had PTSD at a time when it wasn't recognized because it wasn't talked about. It wasn't until I started working more and more and more in trauma that I would work with other clients and look at them and go, yeah, that's trauma. And then I started to reflect back to myself and go, hang on. Mm -hmm. If it's trauma for them, it's trauma for me. Mm -hmm. Right. So all of a sudden, because at the time it, it was just the way it was, I was just dad, right? Yes. You put up, you yeah. shut up. Right. So when you look at traumas that go unrecognized and it may be because you have done a brilliant, 
brilliant job of surviving by forgetting. Oh, yeah. <laughs> that happens a lot, doesn't it? Right. In fact, oh. and, and Dr. Rena Marie, it wasn't that long ago where they assumed that somebody must be putting it on if they suddenly remembered a, a sexual assault or a trauma, you know, a sexual molestation like decades after the fact. And yet I've seen clients that literally when they remembered the trauma, literally their body remembered the trauma where the bruises came back, the welts, like where you could see like not to get oh, yeah. grit, but like, like palm prints on their face, wow. right? Like, in other words, you can't make that stuff up. No. So when you're looking at trauma, you need to look, even in your personal history, you need to look at all of this. When were those times where you felt powerless, vulnerable, mm -hmm. out of control? And it might be when little Johnny was five years old and his mom forgot to pick him up or got stuck in traffic, you know, for two hours and, and he was left there all by himself standing there. Maybe a teacher was beside him because of course they wouldn't just leave him, but little Johnny didn't know that. Right. He, he didn't, didn't know recognize that. that. And time means nothing. And there is no logic in a five-year-old's brain. Okay. So that moment could have frozen trauma in his body that he's not aware of. So all of these, it could be abandonment. It could be, it, it could be emotional abandonment. My mm -hmm. mother did not have anything to do with me for the first year of my life. I did not know this until she was dying and she confessed it to me. And there was a big, long history. It had to do with my father's PTSD, long story. Nobody ever said anything. And, you know, she did her best to make up for it afterwards. What kind of trauma does that do to a baby? That leaves in, in yes, it's imprinted on the nervous right? system. Right? It's imprinted. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. Yeah. So please, for your audience, when you ask about trauma, number one, please do ask about trauma and don't just ask, mm -hmm. has there been trauma? Ask right. specific questions. What physical traumas? what emotional, what mental, but, but give examples. And, yeah. and as you get more used to thinking in terms of this, you'll be able to come up with more and more and more examples. And then it's what intergenerational trauma. In other words, hear that the, people, part. the people who raised you, the people who raised you, in other words, your parents, your grandparents, aunts, uncles, whoever had a significant role in raising you imprinted on you. I love that phrase, that word, Dr. Rita Marie, their trauma responses onto you mm. through what they said, their, their behaviors, and especially when you look at your same sex parent, because like it or not, our same-sex parent is our primary role model. Mm. It's just the way it is. You know, so if you don't, you know, oftentimes there's usually something we hate about our same-sex parent. I don't like how they laugh, or I don't like how they did this, and I don't like how they did that. But guess what? Unconsciously, you were just soaking yeah. it all in when you're in that theta stage and you have no logic until about the age of 12, right? So them especially, you need to look at and go, what traumas did they have that they imprinted on me? Like, and a lot of it, it may be fear. Oh, yeah. don't go, don't talk to that person because, right? Or those, you know, in other words, it was a lot of thou shalt nots, right? Right. Oh, yeah. So, we had a lot of that. Right. And there were people who lived their lives in fear because of that. And, and then you can add into, I'll add into intergenerational trauma, cultural, right? Explain. In other words, I grew up as a farmer nice. and farmers have like sayings, right? That we thought were really smart when we were growing up. And when I stopped to look back, I'm like, it's mired in fear. Better to play safe and small because the higher you go, the harder you fall. Maybe wow. it rhymes. <laughs> wow. Yeah. <laughs> right? Yeah. 
And that like plays over words. and over when it rhymes or is cute like that. You're going to remember exactly. it more than just a casual statement. Exactly. And speaking of intergenerational, how about little girls are to be seen and not heard? Oh, I heard that one. Right. <laughs> um, men, not It was more children heard. are going to be, should be seen okay. and not heard. Yeah. Right. Children. It could be a, a children. But boys. Boys need to be strong. Like suck mm-hmm. it up. Take it like a man. Mm-hmm. Right, all of these add into our trauma programming because what it does is it dismisses your trauma. Mm. Right? Don't cry, or I'll give you something to cry about. Yep. yep. Right? Like all of these things, and I could go on and on. I had a client who was told by her parents, she happened to be Asiatic. They told her multiple times that she was worth less than a pound of rice because she was a female. Oh my God. How traumatizing is that? It's extremely. And you know, parents don't do it to try to be mean or malicious. It's just they're passing on what they've heard, cultural things, religious things, familial things. They're just like, this is just what you say. That's just what you do. Yeah. Right. And then you look at, when I include it in cultural, it's even embedded in our laws and our, you know, has been. Like, think about now corporal punishment is illegal. And, you know, we women are used to being our own own people. We have the right to vote. However, when you think about the rule of thumb, ever heard that phrase, rule of thumb? Rule of thumb. Yeah, 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 of course. Rule of thumb. You know where that came from? No, I don't. That came from British law. And it was meant to be humanitarian at a time where women, children, animals were all considered chattels. And it was the man's duty to discipline them and keep them in line because they're chattels, that the rule of thumb was a law in British law that said, you are not allowed to beat your women, you know, your wife, children, or animals with any stick thicker than your thumb. Oh my God. Seriously. Right? Mm. Seriously. I don't know if that's still on the books and that's. That'd be interesting to find out. That'd be really sad if it is, Uh, but yeah. Yeah. But, you know, that's where sayings came from, like, spare the rod, spoil the child. Oh, yeah. I remember that one. Right? Yeah. So these laws have changed in many parts of the world, at least here in North America. Yes, at least here. Yeah. It wasn't that long ago where it was considered you know, that the right thing to do to, to hit your kids with a stick or a switch, or in my case, in my family's case, it was the army web belt or right. Like, it's like, yeah. when you look at that being carried down, you can change the laws, but how much of it is that the, you know, that other programming has not been changed because, you know, it's like saying, okay, I admit it. I like to speed, but that's like somebody telling me that thou shalt not speed. You must go the same, you know, the, the speed limit for the rest of your life. I'd be like, Hey, we'll see about that. <laughs> you know, so the rebellion <laughs> pops out. Rebellion. Ooh. Right. It's like, right. How much of that could fit in there? I'm being, yeah. you know, somewhat silly. Yeah, about you're being it. Somewhat silly how much but... of that could fit in there? Don't tell me how to run my family. Yeah. Right. So again, when you look at all of this and carried forward, you can see it at the individual level, how our parents and caregivers have imprinted upon us, our, our culture, our communities, our religions, even that women may be second class citizens that, you know, that they deserve in certain countries, right. It's still legal for a man to kill his wife if she has done dishonor to him. My goodness. Right? I'm yeah. not going to get gross. And yet there are some very, like, or however they choose to do it. And they're not 
punished because that's that's part of their religion. Okay. Okay. So, right. So, again, sorry if this is traumatizing (laughs) listening to this. There's one more level still. Okay. Beyond intergenerational. It's similar, but they need to be separated out. And that is epigenetic trauma. Okay. Epigenetic Tell us more. trauma. We think about epigenetics as a positive thing, right? You're going to, you have these genes and you want to express them best. You eat well, you blah, 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 blah. But I've not heard epigenetic trauma discussed before. So tell us more about that. Well, that's because I coined that phrase. Okay. Yes. So, and yet you're right, right? Epigenetics simply means the modification of the expression of your DNA, right? Right. We all know that. Your community knows that, I'm sure which is why I use that in this case, because when we talk about intergenerational trauma, that is that nurture, right? The socialization, the programming that way. Now they have done research, really amazing research, that has shown that trauma modifies the expression of your DNA. So Mm. that trauma at an individual level, Mm -hmm. right? So when you have personal trauma, it modifies the expression of your DNA and it upregulates, turns on inflammatory genes, disease-causing genes like oncogenes, Mm -hmm. right? It downregulates the anti-inflammatory genes, I'm keeping the words really simple, and downregulates, turns off your healthy immune system genes, right? So it's setting you up for disease, disability, and an early death, right? So that's happening at the personal level. Where it gets interesting is that they have shown in research, and I think they've gone, I know for sure, three generations, possibly seven, trying to remember off the top of my head. But I'm but for sure three generations or more that that is carried down, that modification is carried down through the genes as you inherit it. So any trauma that's happened before you were born has been like it's it's accumulating and they have shown that uh fear responses can be carried down they did it even in rats they did a a a study a very simple study unfortunately um not advocating you know using rats for this geneva convention won't allow them to use humans that they they took rats and um rang a bell of course no response. Then they started giving them a little electric shock every time they rang the bell. Pavlov's yeah. conditioning is there, right? But it's also trauma to the point where they stopped ringing the bell, uh, giving the shock. They just rang the bell and they showed a fear response. Wow. That's straight psychology. That's yeah. yeah. Right. We've known that for decades. What they showed was they took the grandchildren the rats, the grandchildren rats that had never been exposed to the grandparents, never been exposed to electric shocks, and they rang a bell. Guess what happened? Oh, my, they had that response. The fear response. They had the fear response. So there's how fear and emotional trauma responses can be carried down through the generations. I personally have, like, this theory that that's where phobias come from. And, like, if you've ever – I had a client – yeah. And, uh, and just like, and, and they've also shown this in to do with physical disease. Remember I said it turns on those genes Yeah, that also gets carried down. They showed in, um, descendants of civil war POW Mm -hmm. men, right? They did a research study where they looked at the the offspring of the men who came home from war and they compared the ones who were born after to the children, their brothers and sisters who were born before and the ones who were born after with the only change being that 
change, um, they had an increased rate of disease and mortality. Interesting. They showed the same thing in the Dutch famine. This has oh. been shown in the Holocaust. Children, uh, ancestors, uh, what do you call it? Not ancestors. Descendants. Uh, yeah, descendants. descendants. Thank you. Yeah. Of Holocaust victims. They've shown this in African American slave like descendants slaves who were who were abused and whatnot yeah wow. right or even just and and it, so and those are recognized those are recognized and i had a client for instance when it comes to fear responses that she was of african american descent and she grew up in california and one time she was visiting the south on the east and drove past a cotton field and she described a visceral like oh. just seeing the cotton field right and she'd never seen one before never right so in other words that's an example of the fear responses fear response and you might say okay i'm not jewish i'm not african american i'm not all right that's that's not i'm not dutch Yet, so if you look at, do we have anything in our background, like the Second World War, the Great Depression, the First World War right. in common? How about right. COVID now, the sea bug? Yeah. Right? When we look at that, and then going back in our personal history, what trauma, unless you were adopted, what trauma did your parents go through, your grandparents, your great grandparents? So on my side, I said, my father suffered PTSD from service in the Congo at a time when PTSD wasn't recognized. And, you know, it was because of atrocities he personally witnessed and experienced and, and again, yeah. no no one to support him. So I was the only one of my six, you know, my, my five older brothers and sisters, I was the only one born afterwards. Oh. So there's that. My mom was an orphan in the great depression. Her father, even though he was British, so you'd go, wow, that's like, nothing ever happens to you. I actually had somebody say that to me. My, my grandfather on my mother's side was what was called a British home kid. It's where his, he was an orphan. He and his older brother were orphaned because their parents died. And so they were in an orphanage in Great Britain. At the age of nine, Great Britain decided to save money and cleaned out their orphanages and sent these children to the colonies, to Canada, to Australia. You can look it up. It's history. They weren't sent as foster children. They were indentured servants. Oh, my. So at the age of nine, my grandfather was ripped away from his last remaining sibling, they weren't kept together, sent to a continent he didn't know about where he had to earn his freedom, wow. which of course took until he was an adult. So there's trauma. My, on my other side, my great grandmother was Aboriginal. Her family were forced marched along the trail of tears as, you know, which is again, American history, you know, so when you look at the traumas, that load. And those are just the ones that I can say for sure that I know. And those are the big T. Those traumas. are big T's. Yes. 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 So right. how does that impact you? Right. As, as a growing up child, as an adult, how do you think that impacted you? That is the best question ever because all of those, remember that backpack yeah, yeah, yeah. It's getting just heavier keep and heavier. Just keep adding in, adding in, adding in. That's a metaphorical way of talking about it. But really what it is, is it is a massive energy drain. Because mm -hmm. all of those traumas cause scars. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Right. On your nervous system, on your whole physiology. Uh, Dr. Hans Selye, the father of stress, who I... I uh, 
took courses uh, through one of my mentors is was his last postdoctoral student of Dr. Hans Selye. And, and Dr. Hans Selye said, every time there's a stress, it leaves a scar. Mm. And, <clears throat> and so when you look at that, it becomes like this massive energy drain, an energy vampire physically, mentally, emotionally, again, I'm going to say energetically and spiritually, that is sucking the life right out of you in physical terms. And I know you can speak to this even better than I can, right? In physical terms, that is a stress on the body, right? So chronic overwhelming stress is a trauma and trauma is a stress and which therefore means that you go through that whole survival stress response uh, with the adrenaline and the right. cortisol and the draining of your adrenal resources, which then sets you up for what I call flame out syndrome. Three month right? syndrome? Flame out syndrome. Oh, flame out syndrome. Yeah. And that's, so what, yeah. I call it that because it's beyond burnout. Mm. Right? Again, all of our, your community and you, I know I'm preaching to the choir here. I have a little pet peeve that burnout is only defined as workplace related. Seabug showed us it's way more than that. And it's only mental and emotional, hmm. right? There's nothing out there that describes the constellations of symptoms and disorders that are the sequelae, the, the, you know, that if, if burnout is not dealt with, then you, you go, you pass, go, you go straight, to, <laughs> right. You, you just go, you go straight to it. Um, and so we know those as the consequences of adrenal exhaustion. Right. And the reason why I call it flame out syndrome is because just as Dr. Freudenberger coined burnout, literally, because he, he, that's how he felt like he, his energy was completely burned out. And he actually saw a homeless person, um, you know, with the cigarette butt, like burning right down. That's why he called it burnout. That's so so flame out syndrome for me is because I crashed and burned literally because, and when I looked at why did I crash and burn? And when I say literally, it's because I had developed one of those physical conditions in the case of my, in my case, it was hypoglycemia. I didn't realize it. And I lost consciousness while driving in Northern Canada and happened to have my two young sons in the car. So I lost consciousness, the road curved and I kept driving straight into a massive like three story rock face and literally hit the wall, crashed and burned. And I broke 10 bones. Uh, my four-year-old son at the time had a, a catastrophic brain injury and had to be airlifted to the nearest pediatric hospital for emergency life-saving surgery. My six-year-old son developed PTSD from what he witnessed at the scene. And fast forward today, take your listeners out of, of their misery. I refused to believe it when once they decided he lived, he'd, he'd lived, they said he would never walk, talk or pass high school. And that was totally unacceptable to me. So I spent literally years, years and years searching and did whatever I could. I went back to medical school, got, you know, specialized in brain injury and neuroplasticity, whatever needed to be able to help overcome that prognosis and because yeah. con conventional medicine didn't help. And my son was missing about 20% of his left hemisphere, oh. still is, still is. And now he not only walks, talks, he just graduated as an engineer from, I know, right? Proud mama moment from one of the best universities in the world. And awesome. he's still missing 20% of his brain. So I'm going to give a little segue there. If you believe you can't do something and you have an intact brain, just think of yeah. my son. Just think of that. Just think of my son. And so 
while that was gone, while I was in hospital with 10 broken bones, could only lie flat. It was during the first SARS epidemic. Mm. And so I was on quarantine, had a lot of time to think because I don't watch TV, you know, those little TVs that are, <laughs> no. I don't watch TV anyway. So I had a lot of time to think. And the question that kept going through my mind was why me? Why mm -hmm. me? And like, and part of it was self-pity, I admit. Because I was bawling, like my, I'm a, sure. I'm a, I'm a crier. I'm not like Demi Moore, like but that little single tear. No, 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 no. Most of us, I'm, I'm a no. ugly, like no red, like. <laughs> and I remember it so clearly in this dark hospital room, all by myself, feeling sorry for myself because I could hear out the window, like everybody having fun, going on with their lives. It was springtime. But the other part of it was. Why me? Mm -hmm. I, I'm a doctor. I've been a neurophysiological meditation instructor for longer than I was ever a doctor. Even at that time, I was a doctor of chiropractic, acupuncturist. I did like, I ate right. I exercised. Yeah. I did yoga. I got as much sleep as a, a single mom with two young kids could. Yeah. So if I did everything right, and I thought there was no burnout symptoms, I thought I was I thought I was a moving and a shaking and a grooving. Like, if it could happen to me, why me? And so that's when I realized that there are these hidden factors. And trauma was that the biggest energy vampire that was, it's, it's like, I felt like I was this high performance sports car, you know, pedal to the metal, like going as fast and far as I could, felt great. Yeah. And had filled my tank, except there was a leak in my fuel line. Mm, that's and a good analogy. I didn't, yeah, isn't it? And and so the fuel wasn't getting to where it needed to go. Yeah. And you didn't have symptoms so, of hypoglycemia, blood sugar imbalance before that? Or you no, did and you ignored not it? To that, not to that extent. When I was a kid, uh, I did faint at the altar rail getting communion mm. I admit it mm. and so at that time they said yeah make sure you don't fast before just eat a meal but they again they put it down to to having a so this wasn't so much a new thing it got worse and yeah. again I just I here's a I didn't want to know we purpose-driven high achievers don't want to know, want especially we doctors. That doctors make the worst patients. Let's just say all health professionals make the worst patients, yeah. right? Because we yeah, always yeah. believe that it's everyone else and not us. Yeah. And and things like I would be working in the middle of the afternoon and. I wouldn't even know there was something going on. My office manager would go grab me a tea and an oatmeal raisin cookie. I'd eat it. That was my my favorite at the time. Right. And and because she could see what was happening. I could sing it. Yeah. Right. So it's so I was the opposite end of the spectrum. I wasn't the hyperglycemia. I was the hypo. And if it had happened any other way, I might have just, you know, at any other time, I might have maybe, you know, fainted in my kitchen and would right. have thought you were there behind it. the wheel. Yeah. yeah. Right. With wow. my two young sons in the car. Wow. So, so literally I crashed and burned. I flamed out. And so that is how it happened for me. And again, knowing I'm preaching to the choir, that flame out syndrome can show up as autoimmune disorders. It can mm -hmm. show up as cancer, increased infections. It can show up as chronic pain, chronic fatigue syndrome, Alzheimer's, diabetes, cardiovascular, yeah. on and on and on. Everything your community already knows. All I'm asking is that they consider this hidden factor that they must help their clients heal because yeah. otherwise they're going to be doing everything right. Yeah. And they're and not going to get it. And we see that all the time. We see that people who are doing everything right or close to that and they're mm -hmm. not getting results. So I have a couple of things I want to, a couple of avenues I would like to go down with you. Uh, one is a few more questions and I want to talk to you a little bit about 
And then I want to get to what, what we can do. So what I'm seeing here is that we need to really like up level our history taking skills, yeah. our interview skills with people to start to ask not just about their past, but their family. When we ask family histories, it was heart disease and Alzheimer's and blah, blah, blah. Who in your family was in a war? Was there anybody in your family who, and then, you know, some of these emotional traumas you just mentioned, right? So that's important. Um, but the other thing is there's this whole thing. It's relatively new. I think probably in the last 10 years called family constellations mm -hmm. and it's a whole process. So I want to hear, you know, your take on that. And is this, you know, related here? Cause I, I also have, want to share a little uh, experience I had with it. So let's hear it. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, I love that. And actually, Dr. Amit Agarwal uh, spoke of family constellation therapy in, in our Transcend Your Trauma Summit. It, it's really fascinating because there it's, I, it's more of an, a spiritual and an energetic, like the idea that if you were if you were supposed to be the middle child, but the, the, the youngest baby died in utero, right. Or vice versa, right. That it changed, changed your, your place. Mm -hmm. Then, then it really messes up that first child, second child, baby. The order. Right. In other words, yeah. I, I believe that that is a very powerful part that we need to look at as far as the energetics of it. And that's why I said, and it, it, what, I don't care if people think it sounds frou-frou to add in energetically and spiritually. And that is definitely- no, not in our community anyway. <laughs> oh, good. Oh, no, good. No, no. I fit right not in then. Community. You fit, fit right in. But what I understood, what and that class I went to a weekend workshop and it was an hmm. experiential on family constellations was more, more in depth than that. And it was not just related to emotional and birth order and that kind of stuff. Okay. Um, what we did was we did play acting, like when people would get a turn mm -hmm. to, you know, talk about a trauma that they'd experienced. And then we would, yes. they would pick different people in the room to play my mother, my father, my grandmother, whatever. And mm -hmm. okay. I was watching and a lot of people were play acting different things and people had, you know, some releases and all. And I, but I was like, Oh, it seems like they're just making it up. So I was chosen to be the grandfather of one of the women in the class. Her grandfather mm. was a terrorist and he had been responsible for the deaths of hundreds of people, brutal deaths, obviously, as terrorists go. And so we went through this stuff and you just kind of whatever's coming through. And I, we went through this play act thing. And at the very end, they ended it and I had to run to the bathroom. I was like feeling like my whole body was overwhelmed with this grief, this sadness, this remorse, whatever the feelings were. And I went to the bathroom and I threw up mm. to get rid of that energy out of my psyche. So it was very real. And obviously, you know, for her to have a grandfather who had done these horrific things was playing on her psyche. Mm. Right. So very interesting kinds of stuff. And I just thought maybe it was somewhat related. It seems to me like it is. It's Absolutely. the intergenerational stuff. Yes. Like we came to one point where I was talking about my family and my sister had died of lymphoma. My sister, Kathy, had died of lymphoma. Mm. And as we talked backwards, my she was named after an aunt, my mm. father's sister who died of lymphoma at age 29. Oh, dear. So to me, it sounded like, oh, don't name your kids after any dead relatives because they're going to carry <laughs> some of that energy, right? Some of that energy yeah. of whatever the trauma was. So there's, a, I think there's a lot, a lot more that needs to be explored here. And the epigenetics, the intergenerational, like recognizing the trauma. The other thing you said was, unless they're adopted, something about asking. But I would think that adopted kids have their own trauma that they're oh, pulling in, man. right? The abandonment, Absolutely. the whole bit. And then how how do we help those? And what kind of diseases, mm -hmm. dysfunctions do they 
develop later. And I know a little bit, I have two adopted children and I know a little bit about one of their histories and the father, the birth father had beaten up the mother Mm. and the grandfather had beaten up the mother. So the mother had all this trauma. The grandfather beat up the mother because the mother, her mother died during childbirth. So there was just all kinds of stuff. And, you know, my kid is like, you know, he's like, he's going to defend everybody to the death. He's going to, you know, stand up for people. So I wonder how much of that probably came from him getting to the defense of his own blood mother. So I think there's just so much here that we need to unpack. And many of you are listening going, Yeah, I put people on this great diet. I put them on this meditation program, yet they're not making the headway I think they should. It's like we Mm -hmm. really do need to look at these traumas, the epigenetic, the intergenerational, and their personal history. Like you said, the five-year-old who doesn't get picked up at the the, um, school bus, whatever, because mom had an emergency, but they don't know that. And that is embedded in their psyche so there's just so much we have to unpack about this yeah. orphans um have or adopted children have a special form of, mm-hmm. of trauma in that there's the abandonment of somebody mm-hmm. it's, it's like a betrayal yeah right it's a betrayal that somebody i you know who should have been looking after me isn't it's also it messes with their psyche because then they wonder like is there something wrong with me there must be something wrong with me or mommy or daddy wouldn't have left me Mm -hmm. that's why they didn't love me right and we didn't even talk about betrayal as a special form of 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 trauma trauma. yeah 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 yeah. our our mutual friend dr debbie silber you know, wrote the book on post-betrayal syndrome. So that is, I'm going to throw in another one. How about um, reincarnation, right? Mm. And so trauma from past lives, right? So I have like a whole story on that one that would just be the same thing. So yeah. I just want to throw that in there since we're talking. What's the about possibility if, you know, I know people, a lot of people are like, oh, that's just, boo, you know, voodoo and we don't really believe in it. But there's a lot to be said there. And I want to just say, for us as adopted adopted uh, parents, it mm-hmm. really it plays to the importance of how you handle the story, right? Yeah. The story of why they were uh, with they're with me versus the mother. And I never would tell my kids, "Your mother couldn't take care. Your parents couldn't take care of you, so they you know put you up for adoption." Would never tell that story because that leads to that feeling of abandonment. I yeah. told the story that you were my, you were destined to be with me, but mm. there was something wrong in the situation that you weren't allowed to physically come to me. And then when you were conceived, that person got the message, this isn't your child. You need to find the right parents. And Mm. my kids loved that story. They never felt abandoned. Plus, you have to surround them with so much love and so much support. So I think that there's a lot of ways that can be improved in that situation. So asking if they're adopted, asking if they're wherever in foster care, all of these things come out to like why it's so important to have a really thorough type of a history. In addition to like the ACEs study and the big T's, right, which are covered there, there are so many of those little T's. Absolutely. And um, you brought up a a really great point of you may or may not know the history. And and I'll speak to your audience who are parents of adoptive children, just as right, or maybe they were adopted themselves. You can still heal trauma without knowing the specifics. Mm. Is it easier and faster? to do it with knowing that, you know, like, so that you can pinpoint that time in first grade or when I was three or my mom, my dad, my grandparents. So when we work through with our clients, we actually take them through like a, a a healing of like their, their, their whole trauma load. 
So it's, and that's where it also comes into when you start healing the nervous system. And I know you teach about the parasympathetics and and the vagal reset and right. Those are so, so, so important. And by starting to do those or in doing what I call SOS tools, right. To shift them from what that trauma, stress, survival mode into healing mode, then, then they can start to heal and start peeling back the the layers yeah. of the the mm-hmm. onion. Yeah. And you brought up another thing. Um, again, I'm, I'm going to say this. I'm going to be controversial. Still going to do it. I have been a meditation instructor for whatever over thirty years. Mm-hmm. At a time like I learned at a time when it was only yogis and gurus and hippies essentially that that did it. I learned it as part of teaching biofeedback Mm -hmm. from the very first, get this, the very first female PhD in Canada. Wow. Yeah. And so, and the one thing that I will say, and I learned from, as I said, I learned stress and all of that from like as close to the God of stress you can, Dr. Hans Selye. And I've had this conversation with Dr. Richard Earl, the mentor, my mentor, who's the head of the Hans Selye Foundation right now in the Canadian Institute for Stress. And when you are in survival mode, when you are in trauma mode, meditation is actually the worst thing possible. Interesting. Unless you have been doing it for a long time. For a long time. Okay. Got it. Right. In other words, it's second nature to you. Hmm. Right. Because when you are in survival mode, right, your prefrontal cortex is wiped offline, your executive rock star team. So you are thinking straight. You are in reptilian mode, right? Mm -hmm. Full on emotional survival mode. And within milliseconds, you go to whatever your hardwired survival response is, whether that's fight, flight, freeze, faint, right? We all have them just like animals. We are not thinking straight. What does meditation require? Thinking. Thinking. Well, it's no, you're supposed to be getting rid of the thinking. Well, yes. When you are in I call fight mode Hulk mode. Okay. You'll find my geek when it comes to superheroes. So when you are in Hulk mode and you are like, you're just going, 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 going. You're like, just going, I got to do something. I got to do something. I got to make this right. I got to make this right. You're just like pedal to the metal. Like I just, I got to, I just got to do this. I'm ramming through. I'm like Hulk smashing everything in sight. Just, just going. Yeah. Right. You tell that person. Ah, just go relax, meditate, clear your yeah. mind, sit and rest. What's going to happen? No, if they, they don't don't actually hit you, they'll want to, right? Yeah. Yeah. And if you're like Bruce Banner, where you're just like, you're a genius, but you're like this worry wart. You're just like, your mind's going a mile a minute and you can't, you can't stop those thoughts that are thinking you, right? Just over and over and over again. You, you just, you're, you're lying sleepless at night. You just can't. And somebody says, relax, meditate, calm your mind. You'll be like, I can't. Right. In other words, you are not in control at that time. So what is the better thing? What can we do? Well, that's why I teach these SOS tools. Okay. It's like, what can you do in a few seconds, in a, in a few moments, in a, in a less than a minute to help you flip that neurophysiological switch from sympathetic state to parasympathetic parasympathetic state. Right. And you teach I know you teach breath work. There is a case. And in which case I say, don't just tell them, go breathe for 30 minutes. Give them something to do. Like one of the ways I do is I teach them to count breathing. So Mm -hmm. they have to focus on the counting, right? And so I'll, I'll give them like a structured way to breathe. Give them active meditation. Yeah. Active meditation, which is really great for the hulks. And actually for the the Bruce Banners to get out and go for a walk in nature and and do something really simple like three things I see are. 
Mm. Three things I hear are. Three things I smell are. Nice. Three things I feel are, and it might be outside, like I feel the breeze on my face. I feel the sun on my face. I feel the warmth through my clothes. What am I feeling inside? Mm. So it's, it's, it's mindfulness in motion, really, but it's, 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 it's not silent. It's very structured. Yeah. I like that. I like the sound of that mindfulness in motion. Right. And it's, but by doing so, what you're doing is you're dragging yourself back to the moment. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. To be present. You're dragging yourself back to the moment. And the other thing that I teach and is that actions create feelings. Mm. I have many, many SOS tools, but one of the things that I teach over and over is actions create feelings, which is that your physiology dictates your emotions. So in other words, if you're sitting like this mm -hmm. and you're feeling tired and you're feeling crappy, guess what? This is how you're going to feel mm -hmm. versus if you sit up, shoulders back, chin up, mm -hmm. gaze straight forward, put a smile on your face, whether you feel like it or not. It's not just faking it till you make it. You are literally changing, changing. your neurophysiology, sending the message to your brain that, oh, she must be happy. I'm going to release more serotonin. Mm, that's a great right? point. No, it's the message goes both ways. It's why they, the army spends so much time and energy drilling, pun intended, posture into new recruits mm. to take, you know, young, naive, fearful recruits and turning them into confident soldiers who can run face, you know, you know, run straight into to battle and, and face death. Right. It's that it, it gives you that confidence. And so I will literally have like people, like uh, clients, I say, put a sign around or tell your family to tell you, Stick a pencil in it. So even if you don't feel like smiling, oh, it makes you, you smile. You know that. That's great. Right? It make, it forces That's you to great. smile. In other words, there are many, many different ways of doing it. So I'm not saying to never meditate. I'm just saying there is a a type that so I want your your audience to be aware of that it's it's important that they teach them and give them those structured ways yeah. to yeah. to help them flip that switch. It can be rubbing the inside of the ear to to again stimulate the parasympathetic nervous system, right? We know that the right. parasympathetic the vagal nerve innervates this part, the tragus and then this part. So just having them rub this, they don't even have to yeah. think about it. Just do this. Or I have ear seeds in, you can t give them ear seeds. Right. Uh, so, and, rub and I actually yeah. use these and I'm sure you do with your clients that I, I use them to help rebuild the adrenal system and, and the nervous system as well. So there's so many, or when I have them breathe, one of the ways I have them do, and again, to vagal reset, we know that when you breathe in, you increase, you, you stimulate the sympathetic nervous system, right? which is very important. We want to breathe in, but have a pause at the top and then slowly breathe out. And if you hum it out, again, you are stimulating the vagus, the vagus nerve right. even more. So breathing in and pause. And hum it all out. And that's, that's great. Pause. That's a great. Way right. To so do it. little things like this of tweaking can make all the difference. Yeah. For yeah. your practitioners, that they and they're really easy. And I didn't invent these. You know, I just, I just want to spread the message about them. Yeah. Yeah, it's awesome. And it's it's stuff we don't necessarily think about. And I know we have a couple of people in our programs that say, breathe, you know, doing that meditative heart math type breathing actually makes me more stressed out. So these are great mm -hmm. things to teach them, like very specific structured approaches and the doing part 
right? And if you think about it, a lot of the vagus nerve stimulation techniques involve humming, gargling, um, Mm -hmm. doing things to just, it's, you don't think of them as relaxing. You go, why would that activate the vagus nerve? That's so far from relaxing, but it's, I guess that motion, that movement that's triggering the vagus. Well, the, yeah, gargling I'm is is one of those that it it's it's not meditative. It's just straight neurophysiology. It's that by having them like nice. stimulate the 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 soft palate at the back, you know, where the vagus nerve uh, innervates cranial nerve 10, then you are you're stimulating that. It's parasympathetic. That's how it works. That's how it works. Right. Right. Um, right, right, right. So many of them, you're right, are not meditative per se taking ice cold baths like uh, i'm sorry i don't find that meditative no, i don't do find I that do it? i Not do me. i don't <laughs> i refuse so to i do the cold i do the cold shower at the end no, i always I and again it's one of those things that i still wouldn't recommend that for somebody if they're in the throes of survival yeah. mode right right because it'll just throw you into more but it's like or what the diver's yeah. reflex where you throw cold water in their face oh Ugh. Yeah. So, so the, that's why I prefer gentle ones gentle like ones, this, yeah. like rubbing, because it feels good. You can do this for your children. Yeah, it feels really idea. good to put them to sleep at night. Just rub. That's a great idea. Right. I'll try that the next time I can't fall asleep. Next yeah. time my mind is so active. That's great. That's great. Well, we have had, I've had a great time hearing you. There's so Thank much we could, we could talk about for hours and hours and hours. But I, what I want to do is leave our practitioners with just a few tips for, first of all, we talked about, you know, identifying the traumas. That's the critical first piece. But then once you have, or even if you haven't, like you said, you don't have to necessarily identify it happened when I was 14 and this happened and that happened. It's more that there are traumas there and that we can help them to move through them. But what if, you know, just summarize with a few of your top tip techniques and tips, and then um, I want you to tell everybody how they can reach you and what are some good resources out there for those who want to, you know, take this to the next level. Absolutely. So to summarize, I always say awareness is 80% of the battle and the solution. That's great. So if at all possible, the more you are aware of personally or on behalf of your clients and for your clients to be aware of Mm -hmm. uh, the faster and the easier it will be to heal the traumas. Mm -hmm. And it's also, it does them a great service because it's removing the shame and stigma away Mm -hmm. from trauma. Mm -hmm. Right. So often We don't want to admit it even unconsciously because, again, part of that trauma programming has been, ooh, you need to ask for help. You're weak. You're a failure. Mm -hmm. Right. Or you got to go it alone. You got to suck it up. Take it like a man. Be the strong guy on type. Yep. Right. Tough it out and and barrel through. Again, we purpose-driven high achievers are – you notorious for this, right? Where yeah. things feel hard. What do we do? We just go like harder and harder and harder and push through or just push through. I did that. Yeah. I had a client who described it as she felt like she had a pair of steel toed work boots on and she was trudging through cement and more and more and more cement got caked on and it got heavier and heavier and harder and harder. But because she was like us, she kept Pushing, pushing through until you can't right. until you can't until you hit flame out syndrome like I did right. you crash and burn and I yeah. want more for your listeners and for their clients than that right. the so that is the very very first if there's nothing else that is numero uno number two is start incorporating these SOS tools, vagal nerve resets, uh, as part of your tool kit. Yeah. And again, I didn't write the book on them. Dr. Navaz Habib, uh, has written a book on the vagus nerve, uh, which is really, really easy to understand. And I believe he's coming out with a second one. 
and I teach other SOS tools and start with something. Just maybe yeah. even tweak the breath work that you may have already been teaching. Yeah. Just tweak it so that it's it's that much more um, that much more effective. And pull in somebody if you know to to help with that section if they don't. One reason I love being part of the institute and why I love being, you know, collaborating with you, Dr. Rita Maria, is because I don't have to do it all and I don't have to be at all. Yeah. Right. Thank you. So. It's important to ask for help and reach yeah. out even as the practitioner. Yeah. And, yeah. and then, as I said, those SOS tools know that you're, you could be teaching everything and doing everything right yourself as a practitioner. And if your client is in survival mode, they're, guess what? They're not going to necessarily be following your recommendations. Oh, yeah. yeah. Right? If you have anybody who's non-compliant, Look at this. Look at this. Yeah. Right. Or maybe you're doing everything right. They're doing their best, doing everything right. And say, for instance, weight loss. Mm. And they're still not losing weight. Look at this. Yeah. Right. In other yeah. words, if for some reason your clients are not getting the results that you feel they should be, look at unrecognized trauma. Mm-hmm. And they will thank you because their lives will transform. I've literally had, like, I remember one client, Bob, who gave me permission to talk about him, um, busy suite, C-suite executive, um, MS, multiple sclerosis for over oh. 20 years, and started taking our program to help him with burnout and, like, started working on his trauma. Within two weeks, his MS symptoms started disappearing. Oh, that's awesome. Right? This is the results that you're clients can start getting when you start yeah. incorporating these techniques. That's awesome. Thank you so much. So how do people reach you and what kind of resources do you have that they can engage in and ingest and put into action? I would love to. So my website is successshiftinstitute.com mm-hmm. and they can find me on LinkedIn, on Instagram, on Facebook, kind of not so much on Twitter. Um, Just finished the trauma summit. And, um, but yeah, they have them reach out. They can reach me at hello at drirenecop.com. Awesome. And, and be happy to, to help point them in the right direction. Awesome. Well, thank you so, so much for being here. And for all of you who are listening you know, I know you've heard the whole, you know, trauma is important. We need to address it. But what really stood out for me in going through this was how important it is to up-level our history-taking skills, to ask more poignant questions that are related to trauma that could help us to identify that epigenetic and intergenerational trauma, as well as things that may be buried that people are just not handling. Like you don't just say, do you have any traumas? Oh, nope, check that box, right? Is to really get into it and look at the little T's as much as you look at the big T's, right? Because all the little T's are there and one in and of itself can bury itself, embed itself in the nervous system. But if there's a series of lots of little T's, it can equal out to a big T. So let's work on that. Let's do our best to help people overcome these things. We have all kinds of tools in our toolbox. We have the nutrition, we have the exercise, we have stress management, but we really need to make sure that we're looking and uncovering and then helping them to reverse the damage in the nervous system of all these traumas. So thank you very much. We've been talking to Dr. Irene Cobb. Check out the show notes page. We'll have links to all her resources. And, um, For further stuff, go to inemethod.com to learn more about the Institute and how we can support you in building the practice of your dreams. So until next time, shine on.